in a very similar manner today, having gone through two centuries of severe psychopathological distortion of existence, the phenomenon is beginning to be discovered as pathological, and as it is being discovered as pathological, it's a question of sane, well-ordered existence again comes to the fore. These various developments affect the problems of a philosophy of history. Philosophy of history as a topic has not existed before the 18th century. With its beginning in the 18th century, it became associated with the ideological constructions of history made for the purpose of putting the constructor of the system and his personal state of alienation into the position of being the climax of all preceding development in history. Philosophy of history has become definitely associated, until quite recently, with the misinterpretation of history from a position of alienation, whether it be in the case of Condorcet or Kant or Hegel or Marx. This firm construction of history as a huge system of falsification of reality from the position of an alienated existence is in the 20th century in dissolution. Once the pathology of existence, which leads to the construction of the ideological systems, is recognized as such, the categories of an undeformed human existence will become the criteria by which the ideological systems must be judged. Hence, the ideological systems themselves become historical phenomena in a process which reflects, among other things, the human tension between order and disorder of existence. There are periods of order, followed by periods of disintegration, followed by the misconstruction of reality by disoriented human beings. Against such disintegration, disorientation and misconstruction, then arise the counter-movements in which the fullness of reality is restored to consciousness. One of the results of this understanding is, for instance, that the interpretation of certain aspects of the so-called modernity as the expression of deformed existence has the same structure and purpose as to see this history of the Peloponnesian War, in which he described the decades of this war and its prehistory as a social kinesis, a feverish movement of disintegration and disorder. This does not mean, however, that at any given period of time, be it the period under survey by Thucydides, or the modern kinesis, the feverish disorder, we started to become virulent since the 18th century, dominates the scene alone, while what is going on as modern in the pejorative sense is an undeniable reality, characteristic of the modern period. At the same time there goes on, of course, the resistance to the disorder and the effort to regain the reality lost or distorted. However one wishes to use the concept of modernity, it will have to cover both the movement of restriction of reality for the purpose of the aggrandizement of alienated human beings, the ideological thinkers, and the counter-movement of the philosophers and scholars, which in our time culminates in this splendid development of the historical sciences, which reveal the ideological attempts, which still go on, as grotesque. One can find today, already for instance, side by side, a great revisionist movement among American historians who rewrite the history of the Cold War with their Marxist bias and the characterization of these activities as para-Marxist buffonery by a scholar like Raymond Aron. From the application of these fundamental concepts concerning order and disorder of existence 
to the ever-increasing amount of historical materials, certain structural lines of meaning in history begin to emerge, always with the reservation, of course, that they will have to be revised in the light of further historical knowledge. One of the important results that will be incorporated in the forthcoming volume four of Order and History is the description of the Ecumenic Age. The Ecumenic Age is meant a period in the history of mankind extending roughly from the period from the time of the Roaster and the beginnings of the Achaemenid conquest to the end of the Roman Empire. This is a period in which the cosmological understanding of reality was definitely replaced by a new understanding of reality centered in the differentiation of the truth of existence through Hellenic philosophy and the Christian pneumatic experiences. In social extent, the Ecumenic Age reaches from the Persian and in its wake the Greek and Roman developments in the West to the parallel development of ecumenic consciousness in the Far Eastern civilizations, especially in China. One of these aspects has been caught in the famous Axis time of Karl Jaspers with a temporal epoch around 500 when Heraclitus, the Buddha and Confucius were contemporaries. Another aspect of this ecumenic age is the phenomenon which has given it its name, that is, the imperial expansion through the Persians, through Alexander, the Romans, the Maurya dynasty in India, the Qin and Han dynasties in China. By about 200 BC, we are no longer in a world of tribal societies or small city-states, but in the world of the ecumenic empires extending from the Atlantic to the Pacific. I have spoken of an ecumenic consciousness and mean thereby that the contemporaries of the imperial events interpreted them as a discovery and conquest of what they called the ecumene, as did Herodotus or Polybius or in China the first historians Sematan and Semachin. The Ecumene becomes the leading category of this period and Ecumenic conquest in the sense of domination over the known contemporarily living mankind has remained a fundamental force of history ever since. Even if in practice the realization of such Ecumenic, which now would have to become global domination, has never been achieved. The ecumenic age, therefore, has to be characterized by three of its more spectacular phenomena. The spiritual outbursts on which Jaspers concentrated, the imperial concupiscential outbursts, which have always attracted the attention of historians, and the beginnings of historiography, in which the disorder created by the destructive expansion of empire is weighed against the order established, and this order established is measured by the newly differentiated understanding of existential order. This triadic structure of the ecumenic age, spiritual outburst, empire, and historiography, is a characteristic period in the history of mankind. In my opinion, it has definitely to supersede other constructions of history, even non-ideological constructions, as for instance, Toynbee's earlier assumption of the civilizations as the ultimate units of historical study. The civilizations can hardly be maintained as ultimate units in the face of the multi-civilizational empires created by the Persians, the Greeks under Alexander, and by the Romans, and their disintegration into ethnic subunits when the impetus of imperial expansion had run into various obstacles. 
Moreover, in order to arrive at the concept of civilization as the ultimate unit, Toynbee had to construct the civilizational units in retrospect from the imperial establishments, which he considered their last phase before a disintegrating interregnum. As a matter of fact, the civilizations in quotation marks, which culminate in ecumenic empires in quotation marks, did not exist before the imperial expansion. There certainly is something like a continuity of Chinese history, say from the classic Chu period into the Han and post-Han empire. But the Chinese civilization emerging from the imperial ordeal is definitely not the aggregate of tribal societies which entered into that ordeal in the 8th century BC. And the society which emerged as a Greco-Roman society from the Greek and Roman imperial expansion is definitely not the essence of Plato or the Rome of the early Republic. The civilizational societies themselves are not ultimate units of history, but products of highly unpleasant and murderous historical processes, and I do not consider it permissible to project the civilizational societies which emerge from the empires and retain the differentiation of ecumenic consciousness, even if in pragmatic politics they have to restrict themselves with the societies which have entered into the process. One can speak, therefore, of the ecumenic age as a definite period in the history of mankind within the time limits given, from which new societies emerged, in which other factors then the momentum of imperial conquest became effective. When the Roman Empire breaks up into a Byzantine Empire, a Western Latin Empire, into an Islamic expanding new empire in the Near East and North Africa, there is no sense to pretend that the Greco-Roman civilization is still going on. What has arisen are new social units based on new migratory movements, cultural receptions and expansions, which take over the form of empire created in the ecumenic period and now absorb for their justification the doctrinalized spiritual outbursts as their political theologies. The ecumenic empires and their turmoil are followed by the orthodox empires, whether in China or in Hinduist India or in an Islamic Mohammedan empire or an Eastern Greek Orthodoxy or the Western Latin Orthodox Empire. And these new imperial civilizations, which as civilizational societies are by far not identical with the societies embraced in the outburst of the ecumenic empires, have lasted on the whole until the new wave of turmoil and disruption in the so-called modern period. None of these observations on discernible structures in the history of mankind, however, must now be converted in its turn into a doctrine. Orthodox empires are exposed to disintegration when major phenomena like in the West, the rediscovery of pagan antiquity, and at the same time, the expansion of the natural sciences, opens to human consciousness areas of reality which had been obscured by the imperially established orthodoxies. The modern period in this sense is therefore a disruption of imperial orthodoxy by a new awareness of reality. This new awareness, however, can in its turn, as it did, degenerate into an orthodoxy this time of the progressivist ideological kind, because one important element 
has been taken over from the orthodox imperial period into the new consciousness of reality, and that is the deformation of symbols into doctrine. This deformation, which expresses a new state of alienation of reality, man's relation to the divine ground from consciousness. This new restriction of reality will no more last than other restrictions which were characteristic of the orthodox imperial period. The seed of disintegration of ideological empires and societies which, without having assumed the form of ideological governments, as in the Soviet Union, but of free societies with dominant ideological establishments, as in America, this will not last because the pressure of reality cannot be resisted forever. This exclusion of existential order from the public consciousness, in some instances through governmental power, however, is not the only factor that will disintegrate the contemporary ideological ascendancies. We are beset by the same problems as the founders of the earlier ecumenic empires and of the later orthodox empires, that there is such a thing as the ethnic and cultural diversification of mankind. The empires, which we call, for instance, Roman, were of course not Roman. There was a core of imperial expansion in the Republic of Rome, which already had to transcend its own Roman borders in order to organize Italian tribal societies into a confederation, and then to conquer other peoples who definitely did not belong to the cultural ethnic units of Italy, which caused the resistance that later split the Roman Empire, and after the Roman Empire, the Orthodox successor empires. Ethnic cultural diversity of mankind is still an important factor in spite of the assiduous work of social and cultural destruction perpetrated by the Western Orthodox Empire as well as by the other empires in the course of their expansion and self-preservation. It is unimaginable that, for instance, a Soviet empire can permanently maintain itself in the present form against the ethnic cultures of the non-Russian people, who are 50% of the population. We have similar problems on a minor scale in America, where the ethnic immigration, which constituted the American people, has by far not been fully absorbed, and where an increasing cultural awareness of various ethnic groups, which in order to become fully effective, may take a time that has to be counted as a century at least, will considerably transform American society. In the most obvious case of the famous Europe, which does not exist, we have the problem of a considerable number of very marked and self-conscious ethnic cultures who emerge from the Christian Orthodox Empire in the West and have by far not yet merged into a new civilizational unit of a comprehensive strength comparable to the Christian dominant establishment from which they broke out. The end of things thus has not come, and what a philosopher can contribute today to the understanding of an ongoing process is the understanding of the factors which make for integration and disintegration of the type just indicated.